This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Tim is off this week. And just before the Fed decided to cut rates by 50 basis points, I headed out west to Huntington Beach, California for the Future Proof Festival. It's a gathering of the wealth management ecosystem. So financial advisors, wealth management execs and limited partners talking about trends impacting the advisory industry and the future of wealth creation. With me at Future Proof, Barry Ritholtz, host of the Bloomberg Podcasts, Masters in Business and at the Money, and Chairman and CIO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, which is a close partner with the event. Over the next couple of hours, we've got a roundup of some well-known names in the financial advisory and wealth management spaces. Among them, Sarah Malik. She is CIO at Nuveen, one of the world's largest investment managers, plus two members of the J.P. Morgan Asset Management's team, including the Chief Global Market Strategist, David Kelly, who weighs in on the mood of investors. Also, how about an academic approach to investing shaped by a handful of Nobel laureates? That's what they do at Dimensional Investing. We'll hear more. And we've got a check on the pulse of private credit with Alona Gornick. She is Senior Investment Strategist at Churchill Asset Management. Keep in mind, these interviews all happening ahead of that Wednesday Fed decision. And so with that in mind, we begin this hour with a new survey of Bloomberg Terminal subscribers showing a Kamala Harris victory in November's U.S. presidential election is seen as better for treasuries and worse for stocks than a win for Donald Trump. So weighing in on all of this, Priya Misra, Portfolio Manager of Global Fixed Income, Currency and Commodities at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, who joined us at Future Proof. So we are all, we're all definitely thinking about the elections. It's a big election. It's a very close election. But I'll make a couple of points. You know, the presidency is clearly extremely important, but Congress is very important to get a lot of things done, you mm-hmm. know, or, or not done, because the, uh, the 2017 tax cuts are likely to expire if Congress doesn't do anything. So beyond the presidency, we're looking at the Senate races, the House races. So the entirety of the election is going to be important. Secondly, there's a lot of policies that are up in the air, right from tariff, immigration, um, you know, regulation. I, I talked about taxes, spending. I think it may be a little simplistic to say that one outcome is necessarily good for uh, for the economy or good for markets. I think we also have this deficit issue, which is mm-hmm. out there. If the, for if the either tax, of them. <laughs> for either of them, exactly. Whether it's spending or it's taxes uh, or tariffs, they all have uh, fiscal implications. I mean, what I'll say is, as I manage our portfolio, is one our position for one way or the other. It really, from a risk reward standpoint, given that the election is won by not a lot, 40,000 votes or 100,000 votes, we're talking not about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, a very clear divide here. So I would say it's best not to position before the election to see the election outcome and then to see what, you know, what uh, policies are prioritized. Is it going to be taxes first? Is it tariffs first, which is going to have a very different implication? There's also, so I would say when we look at the election and the outcome on markets, I look at the impact on growth and inflation. I look at the impact on the deficit. And then what I really hope is Fed independence Mm. you know remains but that is I don't think we should take that for granted is there any impact there because that's going to have an impact on treasuries as a safe haven the dollar as a safe haven these are all things which require an independent central bank so there's a lot uh, but I would you say you really did say it Fed independence you really are concerned I am a little concerned wow. I mean we've we've seen this little bit before and I think now with the fact that you know the Fed was late in hiking rates are they going to be late in cutting rates? They're about to embark on a cutting cycle. And if you have the president or Congress talk too much about what about Fed policy, it's not great to inspire confidence in the U.S. capital markets. And we need we need foreign investments. And as the Fed cut rates, I actually think foreigners will look at U.S. fixed income. They'll look at the U.S. equity market. So I do hope um, that, that Fed independence remains. I think it's something we should keep at the back of our mind as we think about market implications of the election. So, so the Fed has taken rates high enough that money market funds are yielding over 5%. They now stand over $6 trillion. That's a lot of money. What happens as the Fed begins to cut rates? Where does that capital go? 
looking for yield. Sure. And that's the question I would say every asset management person, every wealth manager is salivating at the thought of that <laughs> six trillion. Uh, historically, that money does move once the Fed starts to cut rates, it starts to move first into fixed income and then into risky assets. But here's the catch. We're in a soft landing and soft landing rate cuts are rare. So can we apply the histor historically the Fed is cutting in a recession. So the money moves into fixed income because well equities might look a little scary. This time round if the soft landing is maintained and that's a that's an if I think there's a case we're in a good spot if the Fed was to cut rates quickly enough we might stay in that soft landing. We have a chance. It's a narrow path but I think there's a chance we stay there. Um, I think that money moves into different asset classes. Not all of it. So there is a reason people own cash, liquidity, cash management. But a certain portion of it, especially as you realize that there's reinvestment risk, that money is not going to stay at 5% as the Fed cut rates and forward, uh, forwards are arguing for a little below 3%. Mm -hmm. That cash is going to give you 3% as people start to internalize that. And I think the Fed cutting starts that. That money then in a soft landing moves into equities, credit uh, and, and government bonds. If the economy slows down, I think you're going to see more into fixed income. So there's a bit of a bifurcated outlook for that money, depending on how the economy evolves from here. If the Fed is starting on a longer cycle of rate cuts, and some people have talked about high three, low four percent is where they end up, what do you do with your duration? Where do you want to have your bonds? Um, how, what sort of longevity are you looking for in, in the holdings? Sure. I think bonds finally give you income. So I joke that fixed income finally has income in it, uh, which is good. Real income. You know, not only are you getting that nominal income, but net of uh, in inflation, you're actually earning real uh, returns. The other thing bonds are giving you is diversification, which you talked about 22. It was the opposite of diversification because risk assets struggled and bonds struggled. That's changed. And actually, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the last couple of months, just mm -hmm. the last two payroll reports that come in a little weaker than before. And this fear of a hard landing or a recession starts to come up. Risk assets struggle and bonds do really well. That was Priya Misra, Portfolio Manager of Global Fixed Income Currency and Commodities at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. We got another take on the investing environment from Sarah Malik. She is Chief Investment Officer and Head of Equities and Fixed Income of Nuveen Asset Management, one of the world's largest investment managers with $1.2 trillion in assets under management. She is also President of Nuveen Equities and Fixed Income and a member of the Executive Management Team. Let's start with technology. I think July 10th was, was an important day for tech stocks. That's where in second quarter earnings, people decided they weren't good enough. So even with NVIDIA and their 122% revenue growth in the second quarter, these stocks had gotten crowded and it just wasn't good enough. And stocks started Was selling off on good news. crazy in your view? Well, it just, you know, it's, it's tough to say what's really priced in, in terms of artificial intelligence. And I think what people are really waiting for, though, is some signs of return on investment or monetization from all these huge AI investments that companies have made. And in any cycle where we're in this ultra growth cycle, you're not just going to see that immediately. So a bit of a pause here as we wait to see that. And these stocks are, even though they're growing gangbuster still, there's, there's so much crowding in them and the valuations and everything just, I think, you know, they roll over for a bit until we get the next catalyst, which, by the way, Jensen's on the road in early October. October, that could be a catalyst. No more delays from Blackwell. And right. also, you know, the stock is not incredibly expensive. So I think that could also be another reason why NVIDIA does eventually bounce off the bottom and, and go up. But in the meantime, probably trading range of 100 to 140. Okay. You know, we're almost done with September. We're coming up on, you know, Q3 earnings. By every estimate, it looks like we're going to be at or near record earnings. Isn't that what's going to drive stock prices higher? Well, before we get to those third quarter earnings, let's talk about being almost done with September because it is the middle of September for the past four years in a row. The second half of September has seasonally been the worst two weeks of the year for the stock market. Earnings have been strong. And even if a recession is coming, and we are in that camp, the recessionista camp, as uh, Bob was talking about earlier today on my panel, um, you know, the earnings are not showing that yet. Employment markets are still reasonably strong. Consumer we're showing some signs of cracking. So I think we're okay for now, um, but we do have the last two weeks of September to contend with. I got to ask a question because every time someone says the Fed knows something we don't know. The Fed didn't know inflation was coming. They were late. The Fed didn't know inflation was peaked. They were late. What are you the saying? The Fed didn't know the <laughs> inflation had bottomed. I'm saying they're a large, cautious institution yeah. that tends to move very deliberately. And so... The Fed knowing what we don't know is less of a concern than, hey, when are these guys going to figure out what we've already figured out? Yeah. It, I, I look at it differently than you. 
Well, I, I agree with you on the Fed being cautious. The economy is slowing, but it's not on the precipice of a recession. But on the second part of, you know, I guess it has a little bit more to do with if the Fed sneezes or the rest of us catch a cold. It's not necessarily do they know a recession is coming. It's that if they're so concerned about it, should the rest of the world be concerned about it? You have an S&P that's trading around 5,600. Obviously, the S&P 500 is not concerned about a recession right. at this right. point. So that would be, I think, what would get people unnerved. So my favorite question anytime we're talking about the Fed is what's the terminal rate? Where do they end up when everything is said and done? I think yeah, that's the challenge. So first of all, this year, so in an election year, Fed tends to do more rather than less. So that's another reason I think they start slowly. You might get one or two more rate cuts by the end of this year. Then it, it, it just depends on are we going to get that recession that we've now talked about for two years straight or not? I think that we are. If we get to that, then I think we get multiple rate cuts next year. So our view is they start off a little bit slow, maybe more slowly than the market expects, but then they start to accelerate as employment markets really crack and the consumer continues to slow. Uh, and then, you know, we get to a level where, you know, depending on the level of the recession, session, you know, then we'll sort of see where the Fed finally ends up in terms of its terminal rate. Is there a trade that we should be talking about? I think we should, first of all, okay, so fixed income tends to outperform equities in the 12 months after rate cuts. So we should be talking about fixed income. Secondarily, I think we should be talking about quality overall. If we are going into this recession, companies with strong balance sheet, companies with the ability to continue to grow their dividends and provide income for investors. Also, rate-sensitive sectors like REITs, which tend to have lagged for the two mm -hmm. years as the Fed raised rates, REITs should outperform as the Fed cuts rates. So looking for, this is a little different than what we've been thinking about. Last year's has been about who can survive rate hikes, who can survive uh, ultra high inflation. Now we're thinking about who performs well during rate cuts, which companies might will be able to survive some form of a recession. So you mentioned some consumers are showing signs of cracking. Uh, a lot of the bottom half of the economy is reliant on credit cards. If we see rate cuts, does that start to alleviate some of that pain? I think it could. Already we're seeing, we are seeing consumer delinquencies pick up, second quarter earnings. Companies were not you know, super optimistic on the consumer. Rate cuts, I think, will help. But the question will be, will it, will it be enough? Is it too little, too late? I think given what, you know, the, already what we've experienced in terms of rate hikes for the last couple of years and the fact that we think the Fed starts slowly, I'm not sure that a, a, a couple of rate cuts is enough to get us into the soft landing camp that we all hope for. All right. I was going to ask you, what's the big risk that we have to worry about? Five seconds. What's the big risk? Probably geopolitics. Politics, one that we're not talking about as much anymore. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, will that bubble up in any of the, you know, unfortunately where it's happening? Um, I think, you know, non-U.S. markets are something that people aren't talking that much about right now. That's Sarah Malik, Chief Investment Officer and Head of Equities and Fixed Income of Nuveen Asset Management. You're listening to a special edition of Bloomberg Business Week featuring our favorite conversations from the Future Proof Festival. Coming up, what happens when you focus on academic research often drawn from Nobel laureates and plow that into investment strategy. We find out from a firm that does just that. That's next on Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec from Bloomberg Radio. I'm Carol Masser along with Barry Ritholtz in for Tim this week. He, of course, is the host of the Masters in Business broadcast and podcast on Bloomberg. Our coverage of the Future Proof Festival this past week in Huntington Beach, California, continues. We were both there with Marlena Lee, Global Head of Investment Solutions at the registered investment advisor, Dimensional Investing, which has $740 billion in firm-wide assets under management. If you're not familiar with Dimensional, well, the firm was founded some 40 years ago and historically applies academic research to practical investing. We wanted to know what research is top of mind. From the very beginning, our founders were actually folks who worked on some of the very first index funds, um, and they kind of really liked some of the ideas that were coming out of the academic research around different drivers of expected return, but also just that flexibility has value. Yeah. So from our very beginning, we had these ideas that, hey, you want really low cost, well diversified portfolios that an index fund would give you, but you do mean leave money on the table when you have the rigidities of an index fund. So adding some flexibility and using academic research to pursue outperformance is a winning strategy and we have 40 years of track record to show it. So we have, I think, five Nobel laureates That's that are amazing. associated in some way with the firm, either through as academic consultants, advisors to the firm, or on the fund board. So representing right. our investors in the fund. And they all joined and got involved before they won their Nobel laureates. So really deep academic ties. Um, yes, absolutely right, Barry, that our very first fund was focused on this small cap premium, that was 
well before smart beta or factor right. investing was the a thing. The original smart beta. So, well, I, I like to call it pioneers of, of factor-based investing. You know, we were, right. we were absolutely the first. Um, value came on the scene, of course, right as Fama and French were writing their three-factor model paper. Mm -hmm. um, these days, we're looking at profitability, adding that to the lineup. Profitability is a fantastic complement for value because those premiums tend not to show up at the same times. So we do think that when you build a portfolio that focuses on both, mm -hmm. you can help smooth out the ride. You were a teaching assistant, right, for Eugene Fama? I was. Tell us a little, how did that shape you, or tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh my gosh, it was the best experience. Um, I would have done it for free. Yeah, I was- A Nobel laureate. Uh, he wasn't at the time. Oh, right, but he did become. <laughs> so before arriving at Dimensional, I was doing my PhD at the University of Chicago. Right. Studied under Professor Fama, and then became his teaching assistant. And when I told him, he was also on my disser dissertation committee. And when I told him I didn't really want to do the academic thing, he was so kind because my other advisors, they tried to convince me otherwise. But Fama, he connected me to Dimensional, and it's such a perfect fit because I got to continue focusing on this academic research that I had spent five years of my life learning and studying, right. and instead being able to apply it and helping to explain it to investors who deeply care because it does help understanding the research just leads to a better investment outcome. I think if you understand that there's a more robust, a better way to pursue higher returns than stock picking or trying to time the markets. Um, and just the confidence that it gives someone to be a long-term discipline investors, which, which I think is really important, right. to be able to stick with market downturns and Especially get- in an environment where trades move so quickly and react to day-to-day -day news events, whether it's company stock specific or just macro specific, that when you really understand the deep research behind something, right, you can have a lot more conviction behind an investment, whether to buy or sell. Yeah, absolutely. I think that we are, most investors are investing for decades. Yeah. And we should have a decade long investment horizon and the research speaks to decades long of, of, of patterns and data as opposed to like what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen in the, you know, in the next few months. You're essentially an academic at heart. What's the most interesting new research you're finding that might eventually become some form of real life application of theory? Well, there's always little improvements that we can make, but I would say profitability was the last really big one. Um, some people might think of it as quality. And once you capture profitability, a lot of those other variables, they're not important for explaining Over returns. revenue growth. Well, revenue growth, so we have- It's just we so funny. We talk so much about the importance of like growing your business. Because profitability, right? Profits you can play around with. Well, let's, let's back it up and just talk about why profitability should help explain returns in the yeah. first place. When you invest in a company, you get future cash flows. And it's all discounted back to a price today. That's the stock price. That discount rate is the expected return. So what we want is we don't get to look up the expected return in Bloomberg. Instead, we have to infer it from two variables that we can sort of see. We definitely get to see price today. Right. But we don't get a perfect view of those expected future cash flows. But it turns out today's profitability, just levels, are a pretty dang good predictor of those profits several years out into the future. The most, company, the most profitable companies today tend to stay the most profitable companies for many years. Now, profitability growth is another aspect that does help a little bit, mm. but the most important one to capture is the level of profits. Yeah. And then the challenge with profitability growth is it does introduce a lot of additional turnover. So it's something that we're actively partnering with Robert Novi Marks, another mm -hmm. uh, academic that we work very closely with, to see if there's, there's certainly something there in the data, but whether it would survive transactions costs, things like that are also very important before you add something to a live portfolio where you have to huh. pay trading costs and things like that. Yeah. So, so I want to unpack why profitability has persistence into the future when and and what's so different from just profits because most people think of PE as their measure but profitability means it's a company that sometimes has a moat and a strategic advantage that they're not carrying a lot of debt that can eventually eat into future profits what other elements are you looking at that explain why profitability tends to persist 
out into the distance? That's a fantastic question, Barry, because actually across a lot of different measures of profitability, you see that companies with higher profitability have higher returns than companies with low profitability. That's, you can look at a very top line number like revenues, you can look at net income, so at the very bottom, it all helps create spreads and returns. So that's really important because it gives you a better sense that that's, that's something that's real in the data. You're not just cherry picking something that's really fra like a fragile academic result. Right. And so that's comforting. What we end up using in our portfolios, we call operating profitability because we want something that's going to predict future profitability. So you don't want things that are super variable year to year or one one time events. So operating profitability gets to the heart of you know what are kind of a more stable stream of revenues minus minus costs. And that's what we see um, or what we use in the portfolios that is something that is stable enough where we can run a portfolio that focuses on high profitability names in, the, in a portfolio without a lot of turnover. Is there an overlap between profitability and momentum or is that just something completely different? It turns out to be different. Um, the thing that's more related to momentum or price momentum, which is what we usually think of as momentum, is earnings momentum is related. So Robert Novi Marx did have a paper a few years back where he showed that those two things are quite related. Mm -hmm. um, we do take account momentum in the portfolios as well. But the thing with momentum, just like I was saying with profitability growth, is that it does tend to have high turnover if you try mm -hmm. to pursue it directly. So a better way to take advantage of momentum is if you're already managing a portfolio, let's just say that's pursuing size, value, profitability, you want to trade a little bit every day in order to make sure you're focused on those premiums, not introducing style drift into the portfolios. But you can take into account something like price momentum at that point of trade. So I could say, hey, here's a stock I want to buy, but it's down momentum. Therefore, it should continue to underperform for a little while. Let's just wait before I buy it. Or vice versa, if I want to sell something that has up momentum, right. I could just wait a little. Does let, let go, me, I just want to no, follow go. up with that yeah, because please. I understand the way we use dimensional funds in our shop. Yeah. I understand the way they operate, but I want you to clarify something because I don't want people to misunderstand what you say. What you said, it's not that you think you have to trade every day for the sake of trading. What you're, what I, the way I know the way you guys have run various funds are, you are optim, op opportunistically looking for your time and place to pick up specific things, mm -hmm. and it's not like, hey, let's go trade today. It's Let's see if anything that's on our buy list that we're looking to accumulate has become a, a, a more attractive price point. Am I, am I doing that any justice? So great. That's absolutely right. <laughs> our, when I say we look to trade every day, the turnover in our portfolios are, is very low. So a core portfolio might have something in the high single digits. Mm -hmm. A higher, more narrow portfolio, like a small value portfolio, for example, might be somewhere between 20 to 30% turnover. Just to translate that, a 25% annualized turnover means when I buy a stock, I expect to hold it for four years. So it's a long holding period, yeah. which we think is really important because as you're incurring trading costs, you can spread that across a long holding period. But the daily rebalancing also just gives us a lot of flexibility. So those are index-like levels of turnover, mm -hmm. like passive indices-like level of turnover. Right. But whereas an index might try to drive all of that turnover into defined reconstitution dates, once to four times per year, we can spread it across 220 trading days a year, which makes it really easy to control trading costs. Marlita, does the macro play into this? You know, I would love to be able to say, here's when the premiums are going to be higher or yeah. lower, but the data is just too noisy. So we view, at least in these equity portfolios, we want to be focused on these premiums day in, day out. And macro environments don't really change that view. And it goes back to that idea for why we see these premiums in the first place. It's low prices combined with good future cash flows. Right. And that should always indicate higher expected returns than something with a high price and low cash flow. And that's true regardless of what the Fed's going to do, recession, expansion. Regardless of recession, long recession, doesn't matter. Those premiums are not correlated with okay. all of these macroeconomic variables. And we would love to be able to figure out, to crack the nut of how to focus on these premiums during certain times. But we think it's best to do it every day. 
Really interesting. Very cool stuff. In a nutshell, 10 seconds. The market environment, an interesting one, a hard one, a complex one. How would you describe it? It's always complex. It's always <laughs> changing. No, that's an easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> it is easy. But I, I do think that when you have a long-term view. Right now, today, it doesn't matter. Or what? It doesn't matter. Like, we're going to be positioned on these premiums yeah. regardless of, and, and that's part of why our clients like us, because they know what to expect from us. That was Marlena Lee, Global Head of Investment Solutions at the registered investment advisor, Dimensional Investing. Our coverage of the Future Proof Investival this past week continues. Still to come, the often cited and fast-growing $1.7 trillion private credit market, and what cracks, if any, are showing up. We'll check in with Alona Gornick at Churchill Asset Management. Churchill? It is the more than $50 billion private capital affiliate of Nuveen providing financing solutions to middle market private equity firms and their portfolio companies across the capital structure. You're listening to a special edition of Bloomberg Business Week. This is Bloomberg. is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. I'm Carol Masser, along with Barry Ritholtz, of course, the host of the Masters in Business broadcast and podcast on Bloomberg. Our coverage of the Future Proof Festival held this past week in California continuing with another voice well known to the Bloomberg community and audience. We are talking about David Kelly, who has been J.P. Morgan Asset Management's chief global market strategist for more than 16 and a half years. By the way, J.P. Morgan Asset Management is a partner in the event. David weighed in on the always important metric investor sentiment. I mean, it's been a very good year for markets. Yeah. Uh, you know, the S&P 500 is up 18% year to date. Uh, bond yields are down. The economy is doing fine. I mean, it's slowing down, but it was supposed to slow down. You know, but uh, you know, unemployment's low, inflation's come down. So the, the backdrop is good. I think uh, the financial industry is doing very well right now. And uh, I just think that there's a little nervousness that, that, that the, the Fed might somehow scare people. Bill but Dudley, former head of the New York Fed, you know, thinks the Fed should be more aggressive. I think that, that he should have done that they should have done it probably already. Well, I agree that they should have started cutting earlier. Yes. But bringing interest rates down is like lowering a piano down from the fourth floor of a building. <laughs> you need to do it slowly and carefully. And what I think the Fed misses is the fact that initially you cut rates, you hurt the economy. Mm. Why you know, is that? Because, um, you know, you talk about long and variable lags. What ha the three very bad things that happen when the Fed cuts. And first of all, you squeeze the interest income of all those American cons consumers who got money in, in, in money market funds, particularly older Americans. Second of all, the thing that's going to immediately happen is on programs like this and all over, all over America, people are going to say, what are they so scared about? Right. They must see a recession. They're right. looking at all these numbers. So if I'm going to hire somebody, maybe I wait a while. If I was going to buy a car, maybe I should put that off. And so people want to wait and see. The third thing that happens, which is terrible, is that you know, you're thinking about taking out a mortgage. You're going to take out a mortgage today, you want to wait a while. I think I'll wait a while, right? The problem is they don't get this. I, I wish I could get people to understand this. There is a J-curve effect. You actually hurt the economy before you help it. And that's what, frankly, Bill Dudley doesn't get. That's what all the people who are calling for aggressive cutting don't get. This mm. economy is fine. Don't mess with it. Take rates down slowly. There's nothing going on over here. Don't like ignore it. Slight adjustment is just what you're take saying. it down. It's a fine economy. It's like when you're Stop. working on somebody's back, right? You don't just it's, you know, jam it, it in. It's, they're, they're, they're like you know, it's, it's like medieval medicine. I mean, you know, the most dangerous thing is when you're told the doctor's going to come to, to, to cure you because they'll probably kill you. I mean, just just Amputation. lay off, right? Just lay off. So <laughs> so let's let's take this down a couple of months. It feels like they're way behind the curve. Where do they end up? Where do you see this going? by the first quarter of next year? Well, there is, I mean, I don't think they're way behind the curve. I don't think they should have pushed rates up high, uh, as high as they did. Mm -hmm. I think they should have started earlier. But let's mm -hmm. not overestimate the importance of all this for the economy. The rates are too high because the economy is basically a good place. And you need to gradually bring rates down to a normal level. And I think normal is probably three and a half to four percent of the federal funds rate. You need to gradually do that. They, they don't need to do this aggressively. They, they, the, the damage they did by pushing rates up too high has already been done, but bringing it down too fast will actually uh, make the problem worse. Recession off the table at this point, David? Uh, recession is never off the table, but what right, I'll say yeah. is we're not, we're not going to get an, an endogenous 
recession. In other words, it's not something that's been built into the system right now. Some external shock. It's, it's got to be an external shock. I mean, I'm looking at numbers. So do you rule out external shocks? No, of course we're going to, you know, the, the, the history of the 21st century is nothing but external shocks. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens. That's true. Uh, and eventually that'll get us. But it is important to realize that the traditional business cycle, that stress is already behind us. The point at which high interest rates cause a collapse in investment. There has been no collapse in investment spending. There's been no collapse in GDP growth either, by the way. You know, GDP is up 3.1% year over year. We In the second quarter, we think we get about 2% in the third quarter. So there's really no, no, no particular problem there. That's David Kelly, Chief Global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Well, you know, we talk a lot about private credit here at Bloomberg. Just last month, Bloomberg News out with a story noting how the $1.7 trillion private credit industry has grown rapidly in the past few years as higher rates forced buyout firms to look further afield for funding while traditional lenders pulled back. Banks have become more competitive in recent months as they try to retain leveraged loan market share. In response, credit funds started pushing their pricing down, raising concerns about a potential race to the bottom. For a view on whether that is indeed happening, we turn to Alona Gornick, Managing Director and Senior Investment Strategist at Churchill Asset Management, which, as we like to remind our audience, is the more than $50 billion private capital affiliate of Nuveen, providing customized financing solutions to middle market private equity firms and their portfolio companies across the capital structure. Sure, it's been a really interesting competitive landscape as we think about the different segments of the middle market. I feel like they are um, individually each facing this sort of bank pressure in a very different way. I think a lot of the activity you're talking about is largely hitting that upper middle market segment, which makes a lot of sense for corporate borrowers of the size that banks really want to attract. In the core middle market where Churchill's focus, we generally see a little bit less of that bank interaction or bank threat, if you will, in that same traditional sense. But generally what we are seeing is a little bit more competition for the most part, with some upper middle market direct lenders somewhat coming down market, given there isn't as much activity that they can pursue in that upper middle market or a little bit more of a competitive threat. They might want to expand their wings, if you will. But there are ways in the in the core middle market where we can really expand and stay disciplined and avoid some of that race to the bottom, which can come in the form of maybe tighter spreads, looser covenants to no covenants, coming down in market in terms of the size of the business, which is really where we want to stay away from. So private credit has generally been very focused on the institutional market. It really makes a lot of sense to have committed capital locked up where you can draw it down over time as a manager. But what we've seen has been incredible opportunity set in the wealth market that is just tapping the surface, right, of starting to explore private markets, private equity, private credit. But in size, the wealth market is equal in terms of the institutional market. So think about going from 0% effectively up to 5%. When you think about institutions and their exposure to private credit, they're generally anywhere between 5 to 15%. I mean, CalPERS was out, I think, last week talking about targeting 5 going to 8% massive institution. Think about the wealth channel, getting from zero to even five. That's a huge untapped opportunity that we would like to meet. But to do that, we need more accessible products. It has been very difficult to think about wealth coming into a product that has a $5 million minimum. That is nowhere near what a wealth manager or an advisor can touch. So we're really focused on this market. Um, This is a great conference to do it. There's about 2,000 advisors here. But when I think about the wealth channel, I think there's about 300,000 advisors. Advisors. It's so fragmented. How is Churchill going to access this market? So we absolutely need education. We need resources. We need distribution folks on the ground all over the country. We need specialists to help with that education. And we need partners, you know, like technology platforms, like Case and iCapital, help us create funds and ultimately product development that have lower minimums, these non-traded, right. perpetually non-traded BDCs that allow you to come in for $2,500 instead of $5 million. And 1099s, much more easy to access, really simple. Do you think investors are ready for the possibility of it having higher risk as an investment or also having their money maybe locked up and not as liquid in yeah. these kinds of deals? I'd say the top three concerns or at least hesitation points that advisors have when I'm on the road are number one, the liquidity risk. Right. Number two, default risk in the asset class that they're not very familiar with. And number three, it would generally be, you know, accessibility. Like, how am I going to get access to this product and and comfortably get it if, in fact, we are in a Mm rate-declining environment? How will that impact my return picture? With liquidity, you have to really educate folks that these are ultimately 
not traded assets, right? We're putting it in a wrapper that affords you potentially some liquidity and a quarterly redemption, but underneath that the assets aren't really meant to trade. So you really have to educate the client on thinking, if this is something in your portfolio that you will not touch for a very long time, enjoy current income along the way, that's what you want to really think about and diversify the portfolio with an enhanced return. I think that's what's really resonating. What's the typical lockup period? So we don't have one in these funds. In a non-traded BDC, you're actually, first 12 months, you'll have a soft lock at 98, but then after that, you can really redeem your entire amount up to a cap, where we as a manager would cap it at 5% of the NAV of the fund. For three years, five years, seven years, what, what sort of expectation do you have? I think what's great with advisors is really trying to help them educate their clients about a very long-term hold here. I think what's really resonating in terms of benefits about private credit are one that in income generation. It's incredible to think about income generation in terms of a predictable path to retirement. So if it's on your way or when you're in retirement, that is a multi-year potential investment addition to your portfolio. But if you think about the income component of that, it's very similar to fixed income and public credit, but with a really nice yield premium to it. And you were talking about this earlier. Historically, the yield premium for private credit, particularly direct lending versus the upper kind of large corporate credit, has been anywhere between 150 to 250 basis points. That's pretty historically kind of where the average has been around 200 right now we're actually seeing it widen out to about 250 265 which has been because of that really that comeback in the bank market mm -hmm. when things come back activity picks up spreads tighten out but not as much in that middle market so our premium is actually increasing so current income is really going to be really um, attractive for advisors when they think about multi-year in terms of is it three is it five is it seven is it for the long haul is there any stress that you guys are seeing? I mean, I do think that there was, uh, you know, milk in the last couple of years and milk in this year, like the concerns about stresses in the private credit area because we feel like that there isn't enough transparency. You know, you know the arguments, uh, but I'm just curious, you know, re renegotiating the terms of deals to make sure that, you know, there's no defaults and that you can kind of see the deal through. Um, what are you seeing on that front? I think that there are pockets of stress or distress happening in the market, and I think it's going to be vintage still, specific. Still, still. Yes, and actually showing its, its, its ugly head a little bit more so when you think about the most aggressive deals were generally done in and around the time where we saw massive recovery post-COVID, a la 2021. Valuations were really high, mm -hmm. really fantastic software, healthcare services businesses were getting bought for you know double digit multiples, and along with that came a pretty heavy dose of leverage. Pretty easy kind of money, um, very low to no covenants. It's that which we're seeing. If you had any issue before COVID and now in an interest rate environment that's been twice as high as it was two years ago, you're gonna feel a little bit of pain right now. So we're starting to see a little bit of that unfold. So that stress, that those cracks, but I'd say it isn't broad based mm -hmm. across all of private credit. I'd say it's sort of isolated to vintages and then even certain parts of the market where you took a little too much leverage than the business should be able to handle. That's Alona Gornick, Managing Director, Senior Investment Strategist at Churchill Asset Management. And that wraps up our first hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio. Ahead in our next hour, more from the Future Proof Festival, including a top financial advisor oversees some $300 billion in investor assets. Also, Joanne Bradford, president at Domain Money, you know, that's the company that Ashton Kutcher and Mark Benioff of Salesforce invested in, plus Betterment CEO Sarah Levy on the next generation of investors. Our coverage from Future Proof continues. I'm Carol Masser with Barry Ritholtz in for Tim. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second hour of the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week. Tim is off this week. As you know, we are highlighting our coverage of the Future Proof Festival that was held early in the week in Huntington Beach, California. The event brings together financial advisors, wealth managers, and the company executives, all involved in the wealth ecosystem to talk about the future of the business and the factors impacting investor money. With me at Future Proof, Barry Ritholtz, host of the Bloomberg podcast and broadcast Masters in Business and At the Money. He's also chairman and CIA 
CIO of Ritholtz Wealth Management, which is a close partner with the Future Proof event. Coming up from Future Proof in the second hour, Betterment CEO Sarah Levy, plus Peter Malouk, who has been named as the top independent financial advisor in America by Barron's for several years in a row, and a residential real estate play by one fintech entrepreneur who left London for the sunny west coast of the United States. Let's get it going, though, with Joanne Bradford. She is president and chief money officer at Domain Money, which was founded in 2022 by Adam Dell, former head of product at Marcus by Goldman Sachs. The financial advisory firm handles everything from real real estate and retirement planning, to education planning, tax strategy, and more. Joanne's background includes executive roles as president of Honey, COO of SoFi, chief revenue officer at Microsoft, and head of partnerships at Pinterest. I do two things here. I I advise a company called Wealth.com, and they announced um, a $30 million Series A led by Google Ventures and City. Congratulations. Which was exciting, and it shows you that, like, hey, look, it's time for some automation and some technology and for some AI to be applied to this category because it's sort of the last one to break. You know, I was in the advertising business, which they said will always be sold over martinis, people to people. um, And this business has said the same. And I think we're sort of seeing the beginnings of that in this part of the business. Not, you know, like the visas, MasterCards, Plaid, Stripes, those things, but actually in the in the wealth management side of it. Um, so it's exciting to see that, to be a part of it. Um, I think there are sort of two camps here um, and all the people I've talked to. One is, hey, look, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And I hope that I get to the end of my career before the iceberg melts. And then there's other people that are like, no, I actually am going to try to change this. I want to be digital first. I want to go after millennials. I want to talk about how people have different needs around their money today. Um, You know, so those are the two sort of camps. And I think it sort of happens in every industry, but it's clear it's playing out here. Joanne, are those two very different generations? Is it philosophical or is it the 50 and older group is like, I'm just going to run out the clock. And the 30, 40 somethings are like, no, no, it's got to be digital. It's got to be technology. That's what our clients want. I think it's both the providers and the customers, right? Um, Because, you know, I think the last conference we were at, they said, you know, in the next 10 years, a third of this um, industry is going to retire. And then, you know, I worked at SoFi and we built a digital first tool, right? Where everybody wants to do everything on a device, wants to have it done, and then they still do want to know that there's human and a person that understands their values on the other side of it. I think it's happened everywhere in life except in personal wealth management. So it's finally going to show up here, um, but it's not. we're not quite ready for it yet. How, how does it change? How do you see the transformation in terms of it becoming more digital or digi- you know, an embracing of technology? Yeah, I mean, I literally, I have a private wealth manager. I don't really want to talk to them. I just open up my Schwab every yeah, day and, and look at that. it. And then well, I'm first stop opening it every day, please. Every? Like, no, like, I like it. Get it, it once a week. Good. It makes me feel good. We just All had right. a conversation about long-term investing. Right. Every day is too I much. Know. Every day. But I look at my Amex bill every day. You want to show me your Amex bill on the credit card? Like, what did I buy? When my know? husband says, let's look at the Amex yeah. bill, I'm like. Ugh. My husband calls it um, the BOD. And he's not talking about board of directors. Box the day. So he's like, a box of the day showed up for you. But what does it mean for a state? <laughs> Estate planning and tax planning and educational planning. Like, how do you guys think about it? Because that's your world. Yeah. So when we when let's talk about domain money for a second. So our our average customer is 39 years old, makes two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and doesn't really want to put their money into AUM. Yeah. They have made some money. They're trying to figure it out. They might have some stock. They get a bonus, and they just don't know what to do. They're overwhelmed. They may have gotten married, may have gotten divorced, um, and they want some professional help. Mm -hmm. So it's a flat fee financial plan. We sell one for $2,500. We look at all your expenses. We look at all your spending. We analyze it. We use a bunch of technology, some AI. We put together a plan with a paraplanner, and then we give it back to you in a 90-minute discussion. Then we set up a discussion after that with all your to-dos and follow-ups. Well, actually... 
log into Zoom, your Schwab account on Zoom with you and help you change, like move that there. Because that's really where people freak out is yeah. they don't know how to do that. Our NPS score is 10 out of 10. What's NPS? Um, net promoter score. It Thank means, you. would you recommend it? And we use it again. And on a one out of 10, that's unheard of. You get it. We get a 10. That's wow. a perfect score. It yeah. is a perfect score. Because everybody at the end of it is like, wow, you helped me, you heard me, I got value, and I know what to do. We have a $2,500 version, a $4,500 version, and a $7,500 version. Most people end up taking 4500 because they want actually A year help. or? One time. Plenty. One time. Okay. One, and then they can come back to us for three to five hundred dollars an hour to be like hey i want to check sticky is it how long do people stay with you guys well i mean you know it's they come back a little bit every couple of years but i think it should be like the dentist you Uh, you know right you you know if you're using a sonic toothbrush maybe you don't go every year right Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know you know the the dental industry came up with you need to go every six months three times a year they want cleanings three times a year that's ridiculous but i wonder if you can tell there's a trajectory of somebody (laughs) who comes to you when they first get married and then or maybe they go through a divorce, they yeah. come back, and then they get married again, and then they have kids, and they have to think about college planning, and then yep. they have to think about, you know, retirement. So, like, so do you see that yes. trajectory? With there's four, That's what I mean by there's sticky. There's four personas. There's yeah. the 29-year-old that's like, hey, I, I need some help here. I have a good-paying job. Um, and I, I just, I like to be prepared. I call them, like, sharp pencil people. You know, yeah. they're like, I want help. I'm going to hire a trainer. I'm going to go to a therapist. I'm going to have the best check, of check, everything. Check, 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 check. check. Then the next group is like a 39-year-old that's like, I didn't do anything. And please help me catch up very fast so we can do that. The next group is a 50-year-old who is like, wow, I had something happen in my life. Health in my family, divorce, partner. I hate my career. I can't do it for the rest of my life. And I need to know how do I get out of this. And they want a financial plan for that. And then there's a group of people that need to help family members where they're like, hey, I'm now the sandwich generation. I have to take care of a parent and I have to take care of a kid. And there's really not anybody that serves that, right? So real. So Those like, descriptions. I, you know, and I've talked, I've, I listen to every conversation. I know this audience from my time at SoFi. Um, yeah. And I, there's nobody really serving that market right? Interesting. We don't tell them what product to use. We're like, use Fidelity, use Schwab, do whatever. And my entire sort of mission in life is I don't care who you use for your financial plan. I just want you to actually have one. I don't care if you do it yourself. I don't care if you sign up for, you know, Mrs. Dow Jane's and take the course. A friend of mine the other day, she works at Apple. She has worked there for 13 years, never sold, sold a share of stock. I said, how do you manage your money? And she said, oh, I'm taking a course on the weekends. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, great. And, you know, she's mother of three. She's like, I got to save for college. I have to do these things. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you have a plan, right? Yeah. Um, and she paid $3,000 for that course. And I'm like, well, you could have just paid someone to do it for you and not spent your Sundays in a course, but like, whatever. You know, I'm just happy that people are, are doing, doing something. It, doing something. Because... You and I know the power of compounding, the power of starting it off, um, and it just really matters. And so mm-hmm. at SoFi, I saw so many people with student loan debt. I you know, met thousands and thousands of people. I had dinners with them once a week, and I know this customer, and I know most people do not pay attention to their finances. So, so Joanne, you yeah. started out by discussing how it's digital first, there's technology-driven, but what I'm really hearing from you with these four different categories of people are that they want somebody, a live human, to talk to yes. and hear what their issues are. How do you marry technology with live human advice? Well, we do it all on Zoom. We have an app where they upload all their documents, makes it easy for them. We give them the report and the action items afterwards. We let them schedule all their meetings and times um, via technology. We follow up with them. So everything that is possible to take out of the process of friction of humans we do except that conversation and the review of the plan and the input Mm. and really understanding your values some people are like i want adventure some people are like i want a career some people are like i'd like to get rid of my spouse you know um you know there's just everybody has something and and they want someone on the other end of it to hear them and to acknowledge what's the most common mistake is it just people not having a plan it is just 
not knowing the number, not ever looking at the numbers. What do you mean? No, just everything? Yeah. It's I in mean, their head. It's sort of juggled like what's your checking balance? I don't know. It's around this. I, I'll give you a perfect example. I, I was talking to a... And just got about 40 seconds. Yeah, a Bloomberg reporter one day and, uh -oh. and she said... <laughs> not me. I have student loans and I said, well, how much do you owe? What's your interest rate? And when will you be done? And she said, I don't know. I just know one day it'll be gone. Okay, so I don't care who you are, you got to look at the number. Really interesting stuff. I mean, stuff. if you don't know what you have, how do you figure it no, out? No, and most people don't. Yeah. They just don't. Really cool stuff. So, fun. Really cool stuff. Really, yeah. really cool stuff. I'm kind of taking notes, going to share it with, with <laughs> folks. I um, told you before she came on, <laughs> she's a did. fascinating person with an amazing background, and I love how she's combined technology and human advice into one and bringing SoFi in with the student loans on it, top of it. It is pretty yeah. cool like how all the stuff you did led up to where you, where you are. Honey, coupon code, one click coupon <laughs> code. We sold it for $4 billion. There's always to a PayPal. tech solution. <laughs> there so is. there you go. That's Joanne Bradford, President and Chief Money Officer at Domain Money. You're listening to a special edition of Bloomberg Business Week featuring our favorite conversations from the Future Proof Festival. Coming up, Betterment CEO Sarah Levy on the next generation of investors. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. I'm Carol Masser, back with Barry Ritholtz, host of the Masters in Business podcast and broadcast on Bloomberg. Throughout the day at the Future Proof Festival, there were various panels and discussions, including one with Jeff Goodlock of Double Line. He was one of the key speakers, which was timely ahead of the Fed meeting this past week. For full coverage of the Fed's half a point cut, be sure to check out Bloomberg.com or head to the Bloomberg Terminal. Meantime, with the Fed and the rate environment in mind, we wanted to include this next conversation from Future Proof. It was with Callie Cox, Chief Market Strategist at Ritholtz Wealth management. It's the firm that, of course, bears Barry's name and of which he is chairman and CIO. Let's talk a little bit about how you look at the world. You're relatively young compared mm -hmm. to old timers like me. How do you, what is the lens that Optimistic Cali, the name of your regular uh, publication, how do you see the world? Yeah, well, it's in the name, Barry. Um, I like to call myself, I, I would say I'm an optimist. Of course, I I have those risks that I see around me, and I think it's I think it's naive to be blind to risk. But in my newsletter that you mentioned, Barry, Optimistic Alley, I try to focus on the context that investors need to understand this rapid fire of information that they're reading every day. Looking back to how markets work, how they've worked in the past, what really matters for the economy. And I bring the data along with me, too. Um, I've been an analyst for over a decade now, and I like to have numbers. Former Bloomberger. Full Former Bloomberger as well. This reporter, is really incestuous, A reporter right? in the options market market, right? Yeah, or yeah, which is market. big on data, implied volatility. So, you know, I like to hone in on that background, but also bring it down to an average investor level so anybody can understand how, you know, their money works and markets work. How do you weed through the information then? I mean, there is so much information out there, but then you've got to weed through and kind of figure out what really matters. Well, I'm going to go back to my Bloomberg days. Um, Bloomberg taught me how to do size and scope, which was if there's a number or if there's a move in markets that hasn't happened in a while, it's probably important. It's probably news and there's a story behind it. So that was the nugget that got me started. And I've essentially built my analysis off of that. Of course, I've learned the fundamentals of stock, the stock market. I've you know, learned the fundamentals of um, you know, the time value of money and compounding over time. But it all kind of goes back to that. If I see a weird jump in prices, if I see a weird move in data, mm. then I dig into the story behind it and I really hone into that journalist attitude. So let's, let's talk about size and scope. You recently had a piece that I really liked talking about 1% days mm -hmm. and you dug into the data of how often we get these half a percent, 1%, 3% days. Tell us what your research found. Well, first of all, most days in the stock market are pretty boring, which is kind of crazy to think about because the news is screaming at you every day about how important it is. Uh, I believe, I think it was more than half of days were uh, 25 basis points, or excuse me, 50 basis points. 53% of the 0 days. 0.5%. Your data is 53% of the days is 50, half a ba uh, 50 bips of half a percent or less. 
Correct. Which is kind of crazy. So more than half the day is like nothing's really going on. Exactly. And stock market math is a little weird, right? I mean, when I think about percents, I think about sales, like going to a clothing store and seeing a sale. And if I saw 1% off, a 1% (laughs) drop in prices, I'd be like, okay, see you tomorrow. Like, give me something a little bit better. But in the stock market, that's actually quite a big day. I mean, about 20%, less than 20% of days are when you see a 1% move. So 1% is important. And Mm. Being able to provide that kind of information can really help an average investor understand those headlines that say, oh my God, the S&P fell 1%. It's important to our clients too, right, Barry? Because we get more questions, more contact with our advisors when they see those headlines and those big moves in markets. And it's our job to anticipate that and tell people in advance, mm-hmm. hey, this is normal. So let's, let's stay with this line. How often do we see 2 or 3% mm. moves in the market? So... That's less often. I know we've seen a couple of those in the past month or so. Um, You know, Barry, you're putting me on the spot, but it it doesn't happen a lot. And remember, 20% of days you see a 1% move higher or lower. And you also have to remember a 2% move higher, people care a little bit less about that because we're all happy we're making money. Uh, So, you know, 2% days, 3% days, they're a lot more rare. I know 1.5% days happen about 10% of the time. And that's the point in my mind where I say this is serious, especially if there's a headline behind it. So, you know, if we see, d- see days like August 5th, you know, where the market melted down because of the Yang Carry trade imploding. August is just a bad month for stocks. It's often when <laughs> I go on vacation. I'm I, thought often they, remo- I no, thought they say that about September. Yeah, Isn't September supposed to be a bad it's, month? It's supposed to be, but I have to tell you, I mean, I often go on vacation in August and there's always something going on or something bad happening and when, stuff. When well, there's I, not as much volume, so yeah, it makes sense. True. There's a big gap. I, I always used to hear the expression, rookies manning the terminals, because everybody who was senior would be away for the month of August, and, and they, the left the, they left the kids on the trading desk. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're not wrong. I mean, I go to the beach in August, too. Um, I am curious how you think about the markets as kind of a, a more efficient clearinghouse, only because there is so much information, and then mm-hmm. if there are worries out there, they kind of get it gets out there. And we will often see kind of a big move in... I feel like from peak to trough in an individual name or even in the markets Mm -hmm. and we kind of clear out some noise and then we see investors come back in. Yeah, well, I think you're absolutely right, Carol. I think a lot about that since the drop we saw in 2020 in one of the fastest uh, bear markets ever. That Special situation. (laughs) It it was a special situation. I mean, that was a once in a hundred years pandemic. But the flow of information is just so fast these days that you do see it manifest in markets. And what that leads to is more emotions, um, you know, more more context that we need to manage on the advisor side. And that's where roles like mine, roles like Barry's are quite important. That's Kelly Cox, Chief Market Strategist at Ritholtz Wealth Management. We caught up with her just before that Fed decision. Now, not sure if Kelly is a Gen Z, maybe probably close to it. On that, we've talked about Gen Z shunning the 60-40 investment portfolio and opting for investing in things like sneakers and crypto or perhaps taking on too much risk and not having enough diversification despite being better educated on the investing environment. We've also talked a lot and often about the great wealth transfer as baby boomers and the silent generation will pass down a combined $84.4 trillion in assets to younger generations. Well, our next guest participated in a panel at the Future Proof Festival. It was about capturing the next generation of investors. She's the CEO of the independent digital investment advisor, Betterment. Here's Sarah Levy. So Betterment Advisor Solutions is really our RIA platform that helps this next generation of advisors reach the next generation of investors, right? And so um, so one step removed, if you will. And what we offer is really a seamless platform to move between investing and cash and retirement. And I think the key to this generation, there's a lot that is the same with this generation as the prior generation, right? A long-term outlook. I want to be better off down the road than I am today. I want to pay low taxes. But what's different is their expectation of technology, right? Fundamentally, they have grown up in a world where everything from e-commerce to streaming is delightful and easy, and they expect the same of the platform they use for financial advice. And I can access on my phone. I can access on my phone whenever right. I want. Right. So, latest use of technology, friction-free. What else are they looking for? Are they different than their parents in terms of what they want in terms of their portfolios? I don't think they're different. We don't see them being different in terms of their portfolios. I mean, I think 
there's a lot of theory around how the 60-40 portfolio has evolved. Because we've done stories about Gen Z kind of shunning the 60-40 and more interested in, you know, investing in things like sneakers and, you know, rather than stocks. So help us understand. Well, you, I, you say that they kind of have the same goals. Well, I think ultimately their goals are to retire, retire comfortably. And when you think about Social Security and the challenges that, you know, they're unlike their predecessors, you know, in the prior generations, they're not as comfortable with the role government is going to play, and they're fearful about what's going to happen to Social Security. They don't have the luxury of a pension, right, which the, their predecessors had. And so I think the idea that personal investing and a defined contribution plan is, is their future means they have to take more control. And I think what's challenging about taking more control is that there's tons of information out there, and there's disinformation, there's misinformation, right? So how do you make sense of it all? Mm -hmm. I think is the biggest struggle for them. And so they're seeking advice. And the ones who get great advice from advisors are the ones who are more confident that they will be able to retire comfortably. Huh, really interesting. So technology, we've been talking about AI constantly this whole week. You guys have been embracing AI. Explain how you use AI to, perf to deliver a better product and better performance for your clients and their clients. So I think of AI really as a continuum from automation. We've been delivering fantastic automation for advisors and for retail customers for a decade and a half. And AI really supercharges what we've been doing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of fear around, which I think is unnecessary, around, you know, is AI going to take over the jobs? And I think the better way to think about it is AI, people who don't understand AI, those are the ones who are, whose jobs are going to be threatened because you need to harness the power of AI to basically accelerate and supercharge everything the humans are doing. Right, And so whether that's para planning, whether that's marketing collateral, customer service, there are all sorts of ways where generative AI can basically strengthen the advisor's relationship with their customer by freeing up time and money, which is ultimately what they're after. I mean, it's all about making things easier, right? And seamless. Easier, faster, cheaper. Um, I am curious too, in terms of the younger generation, I mean, do... Are they feeling like it is going to be largely, you talked about 401ks and that it's going to be the financial markets? Because I think I have, you know, I had a dad who had a pension and VA benefits and 401k and it, like just multiple things. And there's a generation that isn't going to have it. Is it going to be all about the markets and they've got to figure this out? Well, you're exactly right. And I think that is the fear that they have, right? Is that I'm not going to have the same kind of social safety net that my parents had. And so I'm going to need to fend for myself. And then to the sort of asset class question, they're wondering also, some of them have a different uh, set of beliefs or a, you know, a social frame that they want to put around their investing. And so they want to make choices, whether that's at the mar margin mm -hmm. or completely about where is that money going, ultimately in service of a comfortable retirement. So, so you'd mentioned there's a not that different goal, but a different method to get there. If you're a 20-something or a 30-something, does a 60-40 really make sense? You have decades before you retire. How do you feel about the people who advocate just straight equity, no bonds? So we think about diversification and we believe uh, from a long-term perspective, you want to be diversified. Domestic, international, equity, bonds, some alternatives as a part of that portfolio. Um, and I think where you are in your life stage, um, that, that affects the mix. The mix so right? not necessarily 60, 40, 70, 30, 80, 20, Correct. something along that. Correct. The mix is about your risk tolerance and your timeline. Last question and just got about 10, 15 seconds. Does a younger generation want investment advice or do they want to do more on their own or is it a combination? The smart ones want investment advice. They do. So they, they just do. go back. Absolutely. Particularly as their lives get more complicated. That was Betterment CEO Sarah Levy. Bloomberg Business Week from Future Proof continues featuring some of our favorite conversations from our two-day coverage of the event out on the West Coast. Straight ahead, top financial advisor Peter Baluk on today's investing environment and figuring out success. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Messer and Tim Stenevec from Bloomberg Radio. 
He's a lawyer, recognized successful financial planner who's been given various accolades, including being named as the top independent financial advisor in America by Barron's for several years in a row. He co-hosts the Down the Middle podcast. He's a New York Times bestselling author. And he was fresh off the ocean stage at the Future Proof Festival, talking about how he's done so much so successfully, sharing his blueprint for success. Here's Barry Ritholtz of Masters in Business on Bloomberg and my conversation with Peter Malouk, who is president and CEO of the Registered Investment Advisor Creative Planning, which has, as we said, been recognized as being among the top RIA firms by Barron's and the Financial Times. Creative Planning and its affiliates have combined assets under management or advisement of $300 billion as of the end of last year. Things couldn't be better. Nothing to <laughs> complain about. <laughs> Is it really? No, seriously. Yeah, th- things are fantastic. I think you, a lot of... Uh, Running a firm or just money coming in? Well, I think you, it, you can't be running a firm and having it going well if money's not coming in. That's ultimately the sign that the market likes what you're doing. Right. And so we're, the, the one thing I look at every day is, are, are people coming to creative planning? And that, that net inflow tells us that we're doing the right things. And so we're really looking and saying for that ultra-fluent client or that high net worth client, are they hiring creative planning many, many more times than they might uh, have money leave? And if that's the case, things are going well. And, you know, when I first met Peter back in 2018, 2019, you were still a reasonable sized firm, but you were like 40 or so billion dollars. Five years later, nearly a a 10x, that's a giant gain. How have you been growing the business so successfully? What has made creative planning such a force in the industry? Well, I think we're, for the end client, we're known for working with that high net worth investor that has you know, the million dollars or $2 million, but we also have 1,600 clients that have $25 million on average with us. And that, that group is the group growing the fastest, but both of these are growing at a rapid clip. And I think that they like, number one, you see people moving from brokerage firms to independent firms. They're also moving to larger independent firms where they know there's more services, there might be more due diligence, better cybersecurity, all of those things that give those high net worth clients uh, comfort. And they also like the specialization of services we have. We look at the investment portfolio through a tax lens and an estate planning lens. And, and the world has gotten so complicated that you know, if, if someone, whether someone's got 500,000 or 50 million, they tend to value that more than they did a decade ago. So talk about that. You use the phrase that, that I'm very much enamored with of being the quarterback for their entire financial life. What does that mean to the average creative planning client? It's like a creative planning client knows, okay, they're not just going to take my money and say, this is my age or this is my risk tolerance and I'm just going to go invest in ABC. Plug and play. Right. They know that's not happening. So they're coming to us saying, okay, this is a firm that's going to have a certified financial planner, figure out where am I, what am I trying to accomplish, what state do I live in, what's my tax bracket, what's my legal situation, what am I trying to accomplish, am I charitably inclined, do I want to leave the biggest inheritance possible to my kids, am I short of retirement? We go through this pretty long multi-meeting exercise to figure out, well, where are they, what they want to do, and then we construct a portfolio that we think has the highest probability of creating the outcome they want, taking into account what's already going on in their life. If they own a bunch of real estate, they're not going to get real estate in the portfolio. And I think that customization, then adding the tax sensitivity to it, really being able to help them have a a much better return on an after-tax basis, I think higher net worth people appreciate that approach, and I think we're sitting at the center of that. We mentioned sexy earlier, but how much uh, of your investors are looking for, especially the higher net worth individuals, are looking for sexier investments? And especially, I think about the private world, private credit, right. private equity, private equity, but especially private credit. Are so, they pushing for something with something more? Yes. Yeah, so we do, at Creative Planning, we're a very big believer in private investments. So we yeah. do use private equity, private credit, private real estate. Private ec- credit has obviously kind of taken the world by storm, and I don't know that people fully appreciate the risk reward there. I'm a big believer in private credit. We I talked just think about it this needs yesterday. To come with a lot of explanation yeah. uh, to people to really understand. You know, and, and private credit's a, a, it's like saying bonds. You know, there's all kinds of bonds, all kinds of different profiles, and so really understanding what you're getting into is a very big deal. But you know, a lot of them want those types of investments or hedge funds. We, we're not a big believer in hedge funds, so we don't use them. But but I would say, as the higher net worth you go, the more demand there is for private credit, private equity. I want to ask you, do you think private credit should be available to the masses, whether it's even fractional ownership of some sort? I think if it if you have semi-liquid, I don't like that word very much, if you yeah. have things that people can get out of every six months or every year, then I think these sorts of investments should be available to people that have less money. I mean, this idea that you have to be a qualified purchaser and a credit investor, I think it made sense five or ten, maybe say ten years ago, right. when these were tied up for seven years and you had a very, very sophisticated to understand it. What happened in 08, 09 is that the, the government really pushed credit out of the banks and into the private markets. They mm-hmm. didn't want the destabilization of the banking system. Banks said, we don't, can't do the due diligence to do this. Now, if you look at firms with revenues of 25 million to over a billion, 83% of their borrowing is coming from private credit. 
basically these 8,000 public companies are now only 4,500 or so. Private companies can stay private longer because right. of all the private credit available. So it's become a very mainstream asset class. You can't freeze out the average American from that. And growing really fast. This is probably the fastest attracting cash. Maybe crypto at various times in its cycle is a little faster. We've seen it certainly explode and then pull back. But private credit seems to be growing so rapidly. What percentage of someone's portfolio should they be thinking about for private credit, especially in the mid, both the mid-level and the high net worth level? So I always start by telling clients, like, there's only, really only two investments. You're an owner or you're a lender with everything, right? <laughs> and so when you're a lender, the, the, the next question becomes, well, how much of my portfolio should I be a lender? Because you really accumulate wealth being an owner, whether it's private equity or stocks or business or real estate. And a lender is more preservation or you know what your income is going to be, but you can't compete with being an owner. That's why the Forbes list is full of owners, not lenders, right? So but if you look at that private side, then you could say, well, what part of the private uh, of the lending side, what part of the lending side of my portfolio do I not need access to for the next couple months or couple of years? If you've got money that's years out, that's the part of the lending part of the portfolio that can be private credit. And that's how I back into the allocation. Do you think it becomes much more accessible, I don't know, in a few years? Like, what does it take? Oh, I think it's happening at lightning speed. I think we're, we're at Creative Planning. We're starting to add it, uh, added private equity into 401k plans. We'll be one of the first firms in the country, if not the first to do that. Really? I think yeah. private credit is going to come very, very quickly thereafter. That's Peter Malouk, President and CEO of the RIA Creative Planning. Before we wrap up our coverage from Future Proof, we wanted to share our chat with Christian Faze, founder and CEO of Faze & Company, which is an investment firm that actively builds and invests in technology-enabled direct lending businesses across the UK, Ireland, Australia, and the United States. He is also founder of the fintech and property mortgage firm Lend Invest, which is listed in London. We kicked it all off with what he is doing, though, right now. So we, uh, we're a private credit fund. We run a private credit fund that gives accredited investors the opportunity to get exposure to what we think is a really interesting asset class, and that's real estate um, bridging finance against residential property. Something you know a little bit about. I do know a little bit about, yeah. So I've, uh, I've been involved in the sector for almost 20 years. Um, originally was a lawyer, grew up in Australia, which you might be able to tell from my accent. Um, spent uh, time over in London. Yeah, spent time in London, yeah. So a recovering lawyer as well, Barry. So yep. um, <laughs> happy, to be, happy to be guys? an ex-lawyer, that's for sure. <laughs> Half of the lawyers aren't practicing seven years after graduation. Why is so, that? Uh, that's another podcast, maybe. That's a whole other conversation. So what yeah. sort of real estate do you guys focus on? Is it just residential or is it a variety of sectors? No, it's residential. So we're, we're very careful to, to explain that to, to investors. Um, obviously, there's part of the real estate market that are quite troubled and sort of making headlines like you know commercial and, and different parts um, but we're we're small balance single family residential our average loan size is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars so it is kind of really targeting what we describe as property entrepreneurs buying the the, the worst house on a nice street replacing the bathrooms kitchen um, and then selling for kind of the flip, you know, the, right? Yeah, it's fix and flip. It is fix and flip finance, and um, and you know it's a big market in the US. It's a big opportunity. And like you're saying, I've, I've done a lot of business in the UK. There was very active um, in the fix and flip market. Uh, that's now the largest non-bank mortgage lender in the UK, and now been active in the US for the last two years. And it's a huge market here. Are these the investors who are like constantly sending me texts and saying I want to buy your house? Are these the people that you like are dealing? No, seriously, no, I get those all the time. Right? Like, are, I get those this? on houses I don't even own. I'm like, yes, yeah, send me a check. <laughs> you that's definitely want to sell. That one. Well, right. that's what I'm, I'm like, in. Here's my price, and it's right. like you know some crazy number. You yeah. want it? It's yours. But no, yeah. tell me, like, is they that? Are. I mean, like who I say, are you dealing we, with? We describe them as property entrepreneurs. I mean, I think that it's a bit of a, a misnomer because a lot of people turn on the TV and see the glamorous couple, you know, flipping yeah. houses, making lots of money, and it all looks quite easy. It's not that. In reality, it is kind of they're, they're real hustlers. They have to work hard, um, and we target property professionals. They're they're doing this full time. Um, and uh, and they do it multiple times a year, so five, ten times a year. And so they're good customers for us. Once we acquire them, we can be their funding partner of choice. They keep coming back to us. Um, and so yeah, so so it's a, a very entrepreneurial borrower, um, but a great so, product. So my brother has been doing this for years. Right. Sort of a side hustle, but he does four or five houses a year. And, yeah. he, and the, the conversation has always been, hey, I'm funding this primarily with my own money. I asked them, have you thought about getting yeah. getting venture funding or any sort of credit for this? Because you could turn this into eight or ten yeah. uh, houses a year if you really want to. And and it's some of these houses are fairly. It's not always the worst house in the on a, in a no. nice block, 
Sometimes it's a very nice house on a really nice block. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to give you my number. You can give to your brother for afterwards. And we <laughs> see that as the well. deals yeah, happening exactly. at Future Proof. <laughs> um, we, we, people that are not trying to sort of maximise leverage. So the average LTV across our books less than sixty percent. So they're pretty conservative. But with a bit of leverage, they can do a couple of projects as opposed to being exposed to just a few, you know the, the lesser number. Um, and there's a lot of tailwinds for the asset class. You know, there's just fundamentally not enough houses being built here in the US, the same as in many parts of the world. Yeah, but that's a whole other story it because is it's in terms of you know acquisition of land and you've got to get neighborhoods to sign on. It's not just a case of here's the money and build no, them and No, sure. They it's come. not just a funding issue. But, yeah. but then the other sort of addition to that is that um, over 60% of housing stock in the US is over 40 years old. So you do have a lot of aging stock that does need mm -hmm. to be refurbed. Um, and so with not enough housing stock and a lot of older stock in the market, you know, refurbing is kind of, is, is something that's very much needed. Something I've got to ask you though, and I'm curious about what your brother says, is that, you know, there are people who want to do projects, there aren't plumbers, there aren't electricians, there aren't contractors, and there isn't a younger generation. I have two contractors in the family too, and but there is not a younger generation yeah. who wants to do this kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I think through COVID, that's been a difficult time as well. You know, costs but have even increased. Still. Yeah, even still. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And also you don't have a lot of end borrowers that want to take a 7% mortgage. You know, to, to buy the right. end product. So it, it's, it's kind of a time of disruption. I kind of see that as a time of opportunity in many respects. You know, banks aren't active in this market. They're just not really equipped to provide yeah. the quick sort of streamlined finance that we provide. Uh, and so, you know, so I think it's, it's a great opportunity for investors to get a superior risk adjusted return against what is a relatively liquid underlying asset class. That's Christian Faze, founder and CEO of Faze and & Company. And that wraps up the weekend edition of Bloomberg Business Week from Bloomberg Radio, featuring highlights from the Future Proof Festival. If you want to hear more, just head to our podcast feed. Thanks so much to Barry Ritholtz for filling in for Tim this week. And thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to tune in to Bloomberg Business Week Monday through Friday, starting at 2 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and on Sirius XM Channel 121. You can also listen to us on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It's free in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. You can also watch our daily broadcast on YouTube. Just search Bloomberg Global News. We're simulcast on Bloomberg Originals, available at Bloomberg.com slash Originals, and streaming platforms including Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung TV Plus, and more. Find our Bloomberg Business Week podcast at Bloomberg.com, Apple, or wherever you get your podcast. And the latest edition of the magazine, available on newsstands and at Bloomberg.com and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Carol Master, along with Barry Ridholt, in for Tim. Have a good and safe weekend, everyone. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines coming up right now.